Hi there, I'm Andrea Koppel, and it's time for Coffee, the podcast where you get to hear firsthand what the jobs and careers that interest you the most are really like. Hey there, Java junkies. Welcome back to another episode of T4C. If you're interested in coding and you'd like to learn more about what it's like to be a software engineer or what about a sales engineer, then this is the episode for you because my next guest is a software and sales engineer who's also the CEO and founder of his second startup in the podcast industry and he only graduated in 2013. But before I introduce you to Pete Bersinger, I want to make sure you've signed up for the Java Junkies Journal. That's T4C's weekly newsletter that comes out on Mondays and gives you an exclusive look into the episodes and the professions that we're going to be featuring that week. And it is super easy to do. You just head over to the Time for Coffee website at time, the number four, coffee.org. And the sign up box is right there on the homepage. Now, my Java lovers, please grab your mug and take a chug of your favorite caffeinated beverage because it's time for another caffeinated career conversation. And my guest is Pete Bersinger, the founder and CEO of Picasso, a company that helps brands use data to advertise more intelligently in podcasting. Picasso shows brands where they're already being talked about, where their competitors are advertising, and then helps them validate a show by showing listening numbers and past advertisers. Pete was also the founder and chief technology officer at Potable, where he built a multi-platform podcast listening app from the ground up into a company with 10 employees, 40,000 users, securing close to a million dollars in funding. Pete, welcome to Time for Coffee. Are you caffeinated and ready to go? Thanks, Andrew. I'm really excited to be here. And I'm out here on my back porch in North Carolina, overlooking the river and sipping my mushroom coffee, ready to go. Wow. Okay, so you're kind of a healthy guy. I alternate between coffee and regular or mushroom coffee, but it's funny because I heard of the mushroom coffee actually on a podcast advertisement. and I've been drinking it for about a year and a half now, so... And how is it? Stuff. It's pretty good. It doesn't have quite the same amount of caffeine as normal coffee, but still pretty good. Very nice. And we should let our listeners know that we're doing this interview. It's the first week in April, and you're usually in New York City. But because of the yeah. coronavirus, right, you went to Asheville to stay with your buddy. That's right. So I usually live in Manhattan. Uh, and usually I either work out of my apartment there or go to a, a coffee shop. But now I'm actually getting a nice break from the city life. And I'm out here just outside in Asheville, North Carolina, out in the mountains. So oh, that's nice. why any birds or anything might be chirping. <laughs> yes. And it's so amazing. That. I love it. I love it. It's like very therapeutic to hear the birds. I should also let people know this is not going to be therapeutic, but I'm again living in the middle of a construction zone. I live in a residential neighborhood in Maryland, and I don't know what the heck is going on, but within my block, I've had already three construction projects, and the fourth is now underway. They are building a ginormous house. So if our listeners hear banging and sawing and whatever, that's what's going on. So Pete has the birds chirping. (laughs) I have (laughs) the the hammering and banging. So hopefully we will not like muddle people's brains too much. Pete, (laughs) let us get into our 10 espresso shots. And the way that we are framing your profession is software engineering, as well as the startup founding world. Does that sound okay? That sounds perfect. Awesome. Okay. So what entry-level jobs are available to young people who want to break into these industries? So I think there's definitely a lot of entry-level jobs for one, software engineering, and two, also to get your feet wet in a startup for software engineering. I know that if you're in college now, for example, if you are studying computer science, so many companies out there, including startups, are looking for software engineering interns, perhaps unpaid, but oftentimes paid, where you can start out even after you know 
one year of school and get an internship with real world experience out there. So I think that would be a great way if you're in college, after college, if you're looking to get into software engineering, there are a lot of boot camps out there and they have, perhaps your listeners may be familiar with it, but income sharing agreements where you don't pay anything for the boot camp up front. But then if you are successful in getting a job after the boot camp, you know, they take some fraction of your revenue to essentially pay for the costs beforehand. And I know a lot of friends who have gotten jobs out of those, actually. And I think those boot camps are only a couple months to a year. So that's another good way. But as a software engineer, though, I'd say just about every company out there has the need for software engineers. So even if you haven't been coding for 10 years, you can still definitely get into the field out there. There's people definitely looking for you. And to get into the startup world, there are... I think more startups than ever right now. There's never been an easier time to start a company fresh. The costs have never been lower with so many great online tools. And I think also there's a lot of funding out there. So there's a lot of startups that are looking to hire junior entry-level people just to help out with kind of routine things. So I would recommend going on angellist.com as one example and then taking a look there to start applying to some startups that may be in a field that interests you. And I think you can totally, especially now in this day and age with Corona, get a remote job. Even if it's just helping with kind of mundane marketing, some kind of mundane tasks, I think you can definitely get your foot in the door there and build your way up. Okay, good. You mentioned Angel List, Pete. Are there any other sites that you can throw out there that are good job boards where you can job. find positions if you've got an engineering background of some kind? Good question. So. AngelList is definitely one of the better ones, especially for for startups. I know I've used another site called Upwork.com, which can be a bit better actually for more part-time gigs where somebody will say, hey, I need this built. And then you could say, I'll do that for 3 k So that could be a good way to start out with some basic part-time projects. I know also, I think more and more companies are starting to advertise on LinkedIn, try to post jobs there. So I think that could be another site. Another site I used as a software engineer was hired. Essentially, they serve as your own personal concierge. And then they reach out to companies and you tell them the salary that you want. And then from there, they'll negotiate that kind of on behalf of you and talk to a bunch of other companies. I can also validate Upwork. I've used it a bunch. In fact, the amazing web developer that I found for Time for Coffee, Levi Muenberg, was on Upwork and he did all the back end work on my website. Love him. And I just hired one other person through Upwork last week. So highly, highly recommend it. Okay, Pete, what is a useful hard and soft skill that you've looked for in the young people that you've hired over the years? So for hard skills for software engineering, I think those are always kind of a standard interview process with those. And there's a lot of whiteboard coding questions. So I'd say for software engineering, you definitely have to be kind of one of those logical thinkers who can think hard through a problem and logically and doesn't mind getting dirty with a lot of technical details. So I think those hard coding skills, even if you don't have a ton of coding experience, I think just the logical thinking and the way to approach things definitely is important for software engineering. For soft skills, I think it's very underrated. But the ability in an interview or on a job to be able to not really know the answer or get something wrong and then not get flustered or upset when somebody maybe tries to tell you, oh, maybe it's this way or maybe it's that way and being able to take the criticism well and handle or resolve the disagreements well, I think is really important because I've known software engineers in the past. I mean, everybody kind of has this, but I've known people to work with who they are very intelligent, but everybody's going to be wrong about some things here and there. And you're going to get into disagreements sooner or later, and it can be tough to resolve those and move forward if the person doesn't have a way to kind of put some of their ego in check and be able to handle or to resolve those conflicts. Okay. So it sounds like maybe in addition to being, to feeling pretty self-confident, you are looking for someone who's humble and who's a good team player. Well put. Okay. What about someone's major? Is it a deciding factor to get into 
especially the software engineering side? And if so, what do they need to study, Pete? Is it a deal breaker if they haven't majored in engineering or computer science? So I think this has been rapidly changing over the past couple of years. And I think it is absolutely not required, not at all, to have a software engineering degree. I know one of my best friends graduated from UC Berkeley with an anthropology degree. And two years after he graduated, he had taught himself programming and had become a software engineer. And I think the reality is that so many companies need software engineers they're not going to use that criteria at all. And I think, frankly, the second thing is that that criteria almost isn't totally relevant because I used to work with somebody as well who didn't even graduate from high school yet was a fantastic programmer. And I don't think this is just my startup mentality either. I've heard very similar things from some of the biggest companies out there like Google, Facebook as well, that these requirements are not totally there. Although I do think some of these bigger companies focus their hiring efforts on going to the top colleges, Stanford, MIT, et cetera, to pull the talent from. But I don't think at all if you're a qualified and eager applicant that it would be a deal breaker at all. Okay. That is amazing. Your friend was an anthropology major and taught himself coding after he graduated? Yeah. No offense to anthropology, but he was having a bit of a difficult time finding a job. And so he went down the coding path, turned to the dark side. No, not the dark side, (laughs) but it just shows what a brilliant guy he is. Yeah, he has his own startup too down in LA. So it's funny just how people can change their life course. And I think there's a lot of different places you can go. A hundred percent. And that is what Time for Coffee is all about. So Pete, what about a grad school degree? And this is less so for somebody who's looking to get an entry level job, maybe more so for somebody who wants to be doing what you're doing, which is being the big boss, you know, being a founder. I know you don't have a grad school degree, but do you think something like that would be valuable? And if so, what do you think are the most useful ones to have? Totally. So I actually did a bit of research at Cal just to hedge myself in case I wanted to go down the graduate path. I haven't yet. But I think for graduate degrees for computer science, I think if you get a PhD in something very technical, I think that could be a good route to get a relatively high paying, stable job at a top company like Google, Facebook inside their research department. As for a startup founder, I think you definitely don't need it. And I think Perhaps it could be helpful if you are doing some groundbreaking research into an area which could give you some knowledge to then start a startup in later on. For instance, the company I started working at called Meraki in San Francisco was actually founded by three MIT PhD dropouts. And so they had built the company off of some of their research they were working on. So I think it can be useful. But I think in the end, I think it ultimately for a startup founder is probably more useful to get out there sooner than later and start trying ideas and learning how the startup world works sooner than later. And I don't think any kind of graduate degree will accelerate your path to becoming the quote unquote, the the big boss more so than just starting out in a startup. Okay, good. What about life experiences, Pete? So these are the experiences outside the classroom. What do you think are the most useful ones for someone to have starting out in this field? I know that you ran cross country in high school. You've run triathlons, won half Ironman, and swam from Alcatraz. (laughs) And you started (laughs) jujitsu. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. And you were also, what, on the ski and the snowboarding team? at UC Berkeley. So, I mean, you've done all kinds of things that are probably more in the sports world. Do you think that's the kind of thing that maybe to have that kind of grit, that stick to is really important? What kind of life experiences do you think our young listeners should try to be getting? Yeah, I think you definitely brought up an interesting point there that I think is actually fairly valid. And I do think from some of the quote unquote athletic things I've been interested in the past, I do think a good amount of persistence comes with them just because with cross country or the half Ironman, I think so much of that is giving yourself or making yourself have the self-discipline to continue training and to keep going when things get a bit tough. 
similarly with jujitsu, where it's wrestling with somebody else and they could be on top of you or have you in an arm lock. And I think at so many points, things seem like they're hopeless, but you kind of have to keep going. And I think that's very applicable in the startup world where for so long and so often, I think things can seem totally against you and seem like nothing's working. But then it's just a matter of going back there and keep giving it your best and knowing that that is all you can do and that eventually something will work out. So I would definitely say if there are any kind of competitive sport like that, I don't know if it's for everybody, but at least for me, you know, the the running, the triathlons, those were good just to keep myself disciplined, to help grow it, just to make sure I was training and on point, especially during the races. And then also, I've always enjoyed jujitsu just because of the competitive nature of it. And I think that is also great for mental discipline as well. But I, I think there are a lot of similar sports out there like that where you could get similar benefits for sure. Yeah, I have always loved running. I didn't run for like 20 years, but I just got back into it. And when I was young, a little younger than you, Pete, I ran a marathon and absolutely love that experience of feeling like you can't go on any further and yet you do. And that kind of unbelievable satisfaction and fulfillment you get out of pushing yourself farther than you thought you could go and doing it and just kind of reveling in that achievement. And I think that the same thing applies to just about anything out there, (laughs) whether it's trying to become a software engineer, getting through school, paying for school, juggling your side hustle or your part-time job or whatever it is, and that deep sense of accomplishment and achievement that comes out of it. What about for you, Pete, would you say is the best part of being in this profession? I think the best part for me is knowing that I am the sole one in charge of whether I succeed or fail. So it's a bit of a double edged sword. But the best part, I think, is that if I wanted to, you know, I could go out and go fishing all day today, or I could sit here and work all day. But it's really, you know, nobody is here telling me that I have to do this, or I have to do that. But it all comes from inside, knowing that I have to get this done to make this work. And if I don't, then it's totally on me. So I think the freedom and control of your own life, I think is my favorite part. Love it. And I agree 100% that having that latitude to decide that you're going to sleep in, which you would probably never do, but whatever it is, you know, if something happens, like if there's an emergency or if there's an amazing opportunity for you to like go off with your friends and do something, you don't have to worry about getting permission to do it. It's up to you. But there's always a flip side. With that kind of freedom comes responsibility. So what is the part of your current job, Pete, that sucks the most? Right. The flip side. So just as there's the benefit of having the freedom, I think the flip side with that is knowing that you alone need to bring the money in and you alone are responsible for making sure everything works. So as with a normal job, a stable job at a company, your paycheck is most likely going to keep coming in month after month. Whereas in the case of the startup world or the business founder, your income can be a lot more unpredictable. So you have to be willing to go over those ups and downs and be able to ride them out. And just knowing that if I don't go out and do anything, I'm not going to get paid is definitely a very good motivator, but it can also be a bit scary at times. So it's certainly not for everybody. Yeah. And I have to imagine the other piece is like when the weekend comes around, it's not like you can totally unplug and you don't have to worry about anything. Like it's probably on your mind 24 seven. Yeah. I don't know if my old Meraki bosses or tap ad bosses are going to be listening, but I have definitely never worked close to as hard at my normal job than I have at the startup afterwards. I'm guessing they're not too surprised to hear yeah. that. <laughs> I think they, they probably know. <laughs> <laughs> right. They've been there, done that. Hey, Pete, what is the best career advice you've ever gotten? The best career advice I've ever gotten is 
I think I listened to an audiobook that described how the goal essentially is to build an online money tree, essentially. And the way you do that is by building an online business that can continue to grow and grow where you separate your time from the money that you earn. So essentially, you're not needing to put in hours to continue making money. And I think once I heard that a couple years ago, that kind of really put things in perspective in my mind where the goal was not to work a steady job for the rest of my life. But instead, the goal was to build an asset like this, a business essentially that could separate money being earned from time that I put into it. So I think the framing of that in my mind really helped. Again, it's definitely not for everybody that strategy. But for me, that really clicked in my head and sent me down that path. Okay. So it sounds like another way of saying it, and tell me if I'm totally screwing this up, but is you are building something that can help become sort of passive income down the line. Yeah, 100%. Great. Okay. Two final espresso shots. What movies, if any, or Netflix, Hulu, Amazon shows, or books, Pete, do you think accurately depict your profession? I actually I don't watch a ton of movies or TV, but I think I've seen Silicon Valley and that is not far off. The reason I actually can't watch that show is because it's eerily similar to my life in too many regards. So it's kind of a little bit haunting. So I'd say that one is a pretty good one. Okay. Great. We'll include a link to that in show notes. And final espresso shot. What would Java junkies be surprised to learn about your profession? That's a good question. Surprised to learn. I think actually there is a notion that a lot of startup founders are these 21-year-old Mark Zuckerbergs right out of college, these brilliant wonder kinds coming out of college. But I think In truth, the reality is that most startup founders are actually a good amount older than that. And I think the reason is because you need a lot of life experience and failures under your belt to break through and to really understand what needs to be done. So I think that is one misconception that a lot of startup founders are very young when in reality, I think most of them are decently into their 30s or beyond. Yeah. Like I'm in my 50s and I'm a startup founder. It's a completely different thing that I'm building, I suppose, but it's still a bit of a, I mean, I, I consider time for coffee a startup. So we'll see. We'll see where we go with this. But right now, uh, Pete, I want to thank you so much for making time for coffee today with me and the T4C community. I want our listeners to know if they're interested in learning more about what you did when you were a software engineer and now do as a startup founder, they should check out show notes for this episode to see if Pete's main T4C interview has already dropped. Pete, I hope you stay safe in Asheville. Enjoy that beautiful surrounding and continue good luck with Picasso and with all that you decide to put your time and energy into. Well, thank you very much, Andrea. I had a a great time and I hope you stay safe as well. Thanks so much for listening to Time for Coffee, where the professionals in the jobs that most interest you always have time to grab coffee 24-7, no matter where you live. I have one quick favor to ask you. Remember to rate, review, and subscribe to Time for Coffee. Thanks so much.